Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I'm I'm Susan Nicastro, the Ward 4 City Councilor. I'm so delighted you all came. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm honored. Thank you. This is this, my second Ward 4 meeting of 2018, and, and I want to welcome you all here tonight. There are agendas um, on this table, and my business card is here. There are sign-up sheets walking around. Um, on the middle table, I put it right in the middle so it's not far from me, we have all kinds of sweet treats as well as I bought a platter of food, of munchy foods, from a, a new local business called Signature Kitchen. And it's on South Main Street across the street from Supreme Donut. And I do hope you'll, you'll try their food. It's, I think it's traditional. Haitian food, it's del absolutely delicious, and I wanted you all to have the opportunity to try it. It's from a new business in Ward 4. So this, yeah. so at this time, I would like to recognize and thank the following elected and public officials who have taken the time to join us. I've got Counselor at Large, Wynne Farwell, And our City Council President, Ward 3, Councillor Dennis Aneri. And our Councillor at Large, Robert Sullivan. Okay. Um, Jimmy Pereira is here from Old Colony Planning Council. Sergeant Mark Picaro is here to speak to us from the police department. I'm sorry, Captain Mark Picaro, forgive me. Um, and we've got uh, Principal Mary Beth O'Brien from Gilmore Elementary School. So I just want to take a moment to welcome you, to thank you. I'm six months in to this new position as Ward 4 City Councilor. I'm enjoying it just about all of the time, and I'm learning so much about the city. Last week, you might be aware, we spent three consecutive nights working on the budget, having all of the proposed budget items presented to us. It was very, very interesting. I had about 15 hours into preparing for those meetings, and boy, was I tired at the end. We will be deliberating on the budget uh, this coming Monday, June 18th, and then the following Monday, we will be voting on it. So if you have questions or comments or concerns, give me a call at 508-941-0108. I'd love to hear from you. So at this time, I'm just going to take a moment to talk about economic development. That's the first item on our agenda. And the job of economic development belongs to a city department the Department of Planning and Economic Development. It's on the third floor of City Hall, and they employ four full-time people who are working on various stages of planning and economic development. This year, their proposed budget is $308,000. So I, I'm often on the phone, I'm often visiting the Planning and Economic Development Company. By the way, is this too loud? What should I do? Is that better? Okay. It's kind of weird, but I can do it. Um, I'm often in that office finding out what's going on, reviewing proposals for planning and zoning board of appeals and conservation commission um, approvals. That's where things start. That's where the permissions that the city has to grant um, begin and where they get approved. Um, I, I have coffee with the, the Director of Planning and Economic Development, Robert May, pretty regularly because I want to know what's going on in Ward 4. I want to know what's planned for Ward 4 as well as in the city. In addition, um, I'm a member of the Campello Business Association and I attend their monthly meetings. It's a wonderful opportunity for me to meet local business owners find out what their concerns are and what's happening in their neighborhoods. I also meet with business owners. Since I was sworn in on January 1st, 
I've met with nine owners of businesses in Ward 4, including two new businesses. And that's very interesting. I, I only wish them well. I wish every business in Ward 4 well and success. Um, I'm trying to improve Ward 4, and of course a big part of that is businesses and more businesses and economic development. We do have a department, as I said, that's in charge of that in the city. I try to supplement, I try to work with them. Um, we've got to bring Ward 4 back, especially our stretch of South Main Street. The other ways that I'm working to improve Ward 4 for new businesses is I'm heavy duty on cleaning it up versus code enforcement. Um, I'm also responsive to constituent calls. And I wanted to let you know, I've been keeping track of all the calls that I've received since being sworn in. And as of today, I've received 88 phone calls from constituents in Ward 4. Um, and the top three areas that those, the topics that people call me about, the number one topic is code enforcement. I received 15 calls on code enforcement. The second one is streets and sidewalks, including the paving of streets. I received, let's see, 17 calls, no, 13 calls on that. And I've received six calls on criminal activity. So those are my top three items that I receive calls on. And um, th because of these calls, in these months, I've made all kinds of relationships. I've made connections with people working in various departments of the city so that I can serve our constituents, so that I can get answers and action from City Hall. And I've, I feel I've been pretty successful so far. I'm sure you'll all tell me if I haven't been. So that's pretty much what I've been doing so far on economic development. I'm pretty proud of it. As time goes on, I'll be doing more. At this time, I would like to introduce my next speaker, who's going to be touching on public safety and code enforcement, Captain Mark Percaro from the police department. Good evening, everybody. I'm Mark Picaro, I'm a captain with the Brockton Police Department. Coming up on 17 years, I was promoted a captain back in September. Thank you. My current assignment is I'm the patrol division commander, and what that means is I oversee all three patrol shifts. So if there's a patrol car out there any time of the day, that's it's one of my guys or girls out there trying to keep your streets safer. What I did is I brought with me some crime statistics regarding the eight major streets in Ward 4. And one of the things I was noticing early, you know, when I was sitting here earlier tonight is uh, I was going down the list. There's 24 different categories of crimes or types of calls that we respond to, anything from an assault battery to a welfare check. And the, the common call the most responded to call out of these eight major streets in Ward 4 is the disturbance call. So that could be, yeah, that, that, that's, that's, it's cause for applause because, you know, disturbance, it's, it's not a murder. Um, it could be anything from a barking dog to your neighbors arguing to a car racing up and down your street. So as much as that affects your quality of life and no one should have to put up with it, in the grand scheme of things, I think we'll take the disturbance call compared to some of the other calls that we do respond to. Um, code enforcement, we're starting to do a lot more of that. We always have, but we're ramping it up even more. We have a sergeant, Sergeant Will Schleeman. He does code enforcement. He's very knowledgeable on the city ordinances when it comes to code enforcement. We have a quality of life task force that the police department participates in, along with other city departments, and they meet weekly at City Hall, I believe, on Thursday. And usually on their agenda are the properties or locations that have very glaring code enforcement issues. And the, city, the various city departments, to include the police department, try and put their heads together to figure out how to solve the problem. Um, that's it, I guess. Uh, you know, if anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to, to uh, take them. Ma'am.
And um, there's a very nice gentleman who I finally saw on Summer Street, um, parked to keep people who are speeding down that street, that people do incredible amounts of speed on Summer Street. And um, I thanked him for being there because that's awesome. We need to, you know, comp especially if, you know, the kid died on Summer Street when they lost control and slammed into a tree. And right. people don't seem to take any heed to that. That Perkins Ave, people are flying up Perkins Ave, and a kid just got hit the other day on Perkins Ave. My question is, I, when I, I was speaking to the gentleman, the, the, the officer who was there, and he said he was kind of doing, took it on his on himself because he was getting complaints from people to do that. And he, he recommended to me that I call the police department and report speeders. Now, I can probably look around this room and everybody else always call and report speeders, right? Um, I have also called and got, I, I called, there was a hit and run at my intersection. The girl had the, the vehicle that hit her license plate in her hand. And when I called, the dispatcher was like, I'm sorry, we have better things to do. And we weren't even going to send anybody. Told me to tell this 20-year-old girl who could barely even speak, she was so shaken up, to go to the police department to file a report. And I don't think that's a very good way to establish a rapport with young people that no one was even going to cut. And, and I know that it, it's busy on a Saturday night, I get that. But the dispatcher was really rather rude. About, Did the dispatcher about, go so far as to say we have better things to do, or is that just um, not in so many words? All right. But that is we, that is definitely the opinion that I got when right. when I was trying to explain to her that. Um, and then somebody still recommended that I call the sheriff's department if I want somebody to respond, which I didn't think was very very cool. But no, just yeah. I'm just I'm just you know saying you know we uh, we do call the police I report things in my neighborhood and other people do too and you get to the point where you just stop so I guess my thing is years ago you see, saw police in the neighborhoods we actually had a police officer that was assigned to our neighborhood and we saw them on the roads and more visual is there a plan for that to get any better my recommendation is if you don't want to call us because there's a speeder on your street because by the time you make the call, we log it in and send a car, the speed is long gone. If it's an ongoing issue, like I know Summer Street is, the city has a website, it's, it's, uh, it's an app, it's called C Click Fix. Is anybody familiar with that? If you go on the city of Brockton's website, I've never used it, so I don't know exactly how to use, you know, how to log in, but it's, it's C Click Fix, meaning you see a problem, you click on the computer, and we, the city fixes it. I, when they're police oriented in nature, I get all the C click fix complaints, speeders, illegal parkers, code enforcement issues that pertain to the police, and I get those. And if it has anything to do with traffic enforcement, like speeding does, I will forward those complaints right to Captain John Hallisey, who's the city's traffic commissioner, and then he has traffic offices. He must, he must prioritize and list out things for his officers to do. So. Maybe that was one of the officers. I'm not sure who that was. He was very nice. He yeah. was a very nice gentleman. Um, I've seen C Click Fix complaints about Perkins Avenue on there. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the residents commented that when they spoke to police, they were told there's nowhere to hide to catch people. So I don't know if that's just, you know, sour grapes. It happens. You yeah. know, people just are going to throw things out there to stir the pot, a la Facebook and all that. But I'm just saying it's a, it's a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, it's the impression that people get and just, you know. Yeah. So. I'm sorry, you know, that that's happened. But I know, I know myself, like the counselor has sent me a couple of issues regarding auto body shops and one at, uh, on Main Street. I've personally gone out to them a number of times and written tickets and towed vehicles. I know officers are going out there on a regular basis, keeping an eye on things. Um, so uh, don't be discouraged. Use that C click fix function on the city's website. I'll get it and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure we take care of it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Anybody else? Pam? Um, drug sales going on right yep. in front of your house. Like, I live in a neighborhood where there's no reason anybody should be parked in front of my house unless right. they're visiting me. Yeah. And I often have, 
cars doing that. And it, they wait five minutes, somebody pulls up. I know what their in transaction thing is going on. Right. I have called the police often. They're never, they've never said anything like that, but they, they leave. I mean, and then they come by and they drive, I see them drive the neighborhood. Um, I know that's an issue throughout the city. I'm not, you yeah. know, naive about that, but I don't want them in my neighborhood. And um, I continue to call. I don't care if they tell me. Well, they're gone. There's nothing we can do about it. I get license plates. I give it to the dispatcher. Right. I don't know if they put it in the system or do anything with that, but I do, do it. I'm, I'm not letting them take over my neighborhood, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so... And not not see a single police car drive through my neighborhood or or even on the street and I, I work local so I'm on the streets a lot I'm just saying you know deterrence is the key I think you know yeah. I'm not I'm not I don't want I'm not insinuating you're not doing anything but I, I don't see it yeah it, it, there were times and there were times I call volume really stretches us to the max and to just it's unfortunate. We, we, sometimes we just don't have the downtime to, to patrol a neighborhood because the minute a cruise is clearing a call, that dispatch is already sending them to another call. It's not uncommon for cars to get pulled off their dinner breaks or to get pulled off our calls to go to other calls. That's how busy it gets sometimes. And going into the summer season, it, it's, it's going to be challenging. I'm sorry. Doing transactions Keep to on the C when click. You call fix. us, you're doing the right thing. You're giving us the plate numbers that yeah. does get put into the calls because we see it. I've seen it before. Not, not, maybe not your calls, but it, right. whatever you provide to us, we're going to put it in that call. It does go in. So okay. it's, it stays in there so that it, if you hear another call, say you know, it might be a while before we get there if yeah. we're tied up. Sometimes you call. <laughs> that sector car, you know, down in this area would be the southeast car. If that southeast car is clear. They, the minute the dispatcher gets that call, he's, he's giving it right to the cruiser. We don't hang on to calls. The minute we, the dispatchers, as supervisors, part of our job is to make sure the dispatchers are clearing up the board. The board are all the pending calls. So, as the shift commanders or the sergeants, and they have these on their MDTs and the cruisers, they can see, you know, we get two or three calls pending in the southeast area. The southeast cruiser's clear give the call out. That almost never happens because the dispatcher himself knows the boss is watching. So as soon as he gets a call, he's going to give it to the car that, that it should go area. to. Yeah. Um, they'll prioritize, you know. So they're taking down everything I say. Everything um, you say, number one, is being recorded. Really know, so. It's being recorded and it's being entered oh, into that okay. call. So even if we may not get right, right to your street right away to, to find that, that blue Toyota with the, the plate number, the guy might see it later on driving okay. around. Oh, there's that car that was, you know, from that call earlier tonight. You know, it was gone by the time I get to the call. But you know what? Let me wait and see if he forgets to use his turn signal or something, or his speeds now, I'll pull him over and, and do a little something there with him, you know? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ma'am? I just, my name's Annabella Zigwa. I live on um, Litchfield Street. I'm off of Call Ave. Sure. And I'm like you. I would stand up, but my foot is in bad shape. I'm sorry. Um, so I call the police. Um, the activity happens at night, anywhere between 11, 12, 1, 2. And so I call, being consistent. But I just want to say thank you. Your guys were great last, um, um, just last month. I told them they drive up Lit from Baker Street up to Litchfield Street, and then they cut across. So you sent, or someone sent undercover, they drive up or they'll stop, because it's dark where I live. There's only six houses back there. So anybody who lives in a real wooded area it seems like they choose these dark areas where no one's around. Yeah. And um, we told them the name and so forth. 
but they did catch two cars. They had to sure. chase them. So I just want to say thank you. Be persistent. We're all neighbors. Don't be afraid. Um, because in the end, we need our neighborhoods back. And I've lived here um, about 27 years. So don't give up. All righty. Thank you. Anybody else? Sir? Hi. Uh, Hi. I'm a lifelong resident of uh, Ward 4. I have a question. Uh, I know the summer and everything that you have, that there's going to be a lot of parties and everything else that goes on. But there has to be a limit for how loud the music and everything else happens because my, yeah. it's, it's, not fair, it, it's not fair to us as far as we're held hostage in our house. The only way that you, you partially deal with it you close your windows, you close your door, you want to turn up the TV, you turn up the air conditioner, you call, and when you call the police, they say, where are you calling from? Are you calling from outside? And you say, no, I'm calling from inside my house. And what, um, what rights do we have as, uh, as the homeowners? As far, um, far, it's, you know, why are we held uh, at, the, at the mercy of the people who are being inconsiderate, who at the end of a, uh, you can tell that they had a party because the next morning, you have empty beer bottles, broken beer bottles, um, yeah. bottles of liquor as far as in the yard. That's, that's not being considered as far as like for neighbors. Right. Yeah, you shouldn't have to put up with that. Um, it, with the warmer weather come the various graduation parties and all sorts of different parties. It's that time of year, but at the same time, they should be good neighbors. They shouldn't be bothering you to that extent. If, if again, a lot of people might be discouraged to call us, but if if there's a loud party and it's bothering you, call us. We'll eventually come down. I just got two emails, excuse me, one email regarding an address on the north side of the city. And I, I did, I, I looked up in our computer a history of this address. And sure, it was a C-click fix complaint. And I looked it up just to, you know, make sure that the, the information I was being provided was correct. And sure enough, all last summer, a lot of loud music disturbances at this address you know, we went there a number of times, and again, from April on, it was starting up again as soon as the weather got warm. So this person reached out to the police department via, through the C-click fix function. And now I, I've, what I do is I put in future calls for the weekend so that the cruisers can just go to this, this address, whether we get a call or not, and just drive down the street. And what we can do is, what we try to do, it's a balancing act. You know, somebody wants to have a party, we'll go there. And then the officer will determine, in the officer's opinion, is it really loud, or is it just a neighbor that didn't get invited? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We, we got to figure it out. Is, is it truly loud? A lot of times we'll knock on the door. Hey, you, get, you know, we got a complaint. Can you please lower it? They'll agree. We'll go back a second time. We've already been here once already. Lower it. What I'm trying to do now is encourage the guys. It's, it's a crime. It's disturbing the peace. There's another obscure state law called keeper of a, 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 noisy, a, a noisy house. Start taking these people to court. The problem addresses, the, the, the houses that we go to over and over again every weekend because they want to have a loud party. Those are the ones I'm going to encourage the shifts, especially the night shifts because that's when you get these calls. Start charging these people, the homeowners criminally. They want to have a loud party and disturb the whole street. They can go to court and answer to the judge for it. So, again, if you get a loud party on your street, please call us. And there's no time of day where a loud party is allowed. There's a misperception that until 8 o'clock at night or 10 o'clock at night, they can be as loud as they want. Disturbing the peace, there's no, no time limit on it. It could be 12 o'clock noontime. If someone's disturbing your peace in public, it's a crime. Call us. To, as a quick follow-up to that? It, it, there's, no, there's no time period in, this, in the state law that says when disturbing the peace becomes active, meaning, you know, you got to wait till 8 o'clock to call the police if you're being bothered. You, it, it does not matter. If you are being bothered, it does not matter the time of day. You call us. I, I, I don't know. That's... Yeah, I, I, I would suggest that a loud house party 
that's bothering the neighbors to the point where you've got to close your windows and turn your air is that's clearly disturbing the peace. Yeah. Yeah, don't, don't do that. Call us, and we'll, we'll, we'll come down. Yeah. That, sh that shouldn't be going on. You know, the officers should, yeah. <coughs> yeah. If they're doing that after we leave, then I I'd say they got their one bite at the apple with us, then we, we should not be going back there just to ask them to turn it down again. can't speak to, to what you're talking about. I know years ago when I was on the midnight shift, we shut down plenty of party with just a handful of us. Well, I heard um, what... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, that, that, that's all right. Uh, sometimes, it, I don't know. I, I do know that we do shut down parties. I don't, you know, every, every shift, every shift commander, whoever's in charge that night, you know, who they have on the road, the resources available. There's a lot of factors that, that, that go into the consideration of shutting down a party. Is it a problem address? It, you know, can the fire engine get down the street? Is there cars everywhere? You know, it, it's a bit of a process that goes into it, but um, we will, we can and have shut down parties. But it's, it's year after year and it's the same thing. And yeah. like I said, you leave and they turn it right back up. No consideration for anyone else. And there's a dozen people in the neighborhood calling all night long. And until two, three in the morning, this music goes on at such a loud decibel that no one can sleep or do anything, yeah. and yet not once has it been shut down. I just don't understand why the public in the area have no rights at all, and these idiots that have these loud parties seem to get away with it year after year. Is it the same? The, the, same the, address. If yeah. After the meeting, if you want to give me that address? Yes, please. I'll, I'll make sure we, you know. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I don't even need it. I, my bedroom faces these two houses. Yep. And it's all I hear is vibrations of these, uh, like, I, I, I'm here. I've got to be kind. But it is, it is so, uh, I just get all shook up to see them. They're running around. They're like they're having a little... to talk. And I'm very upset that this will be happening again. And it's all I'm told, call the police, call the fire department. You men have enough to do with this shootings and all this other stuff. I apologize, but That's I get right. so shook up about yeah. all this music. to come to my party and right yeah, I'm sorry is it, it that would be if we was to charge them with a crime like disturbing the peace or something else that would be determined by the judge or the court down the road I mean, it's a, it's a crime. They could be sent to jail for it. I'll, you know, would it happen? Who knows? But yeah, usually with, the, with the, the, the lesser crimes, there's a, there's a house of correction sentence along with a fine. 
you know, so the court has some flexibility. So I, I, I would say there probably is a fine for that, you know, disturbing the peace, but that would have to be worked out in court. I couldn't tell you a dollar amount. Charging. How about charging to go to a party? You said they're not supposed to charge. Yeah, my understanding is they're not supposed to charge at a private house party. So is there a fine for that? And should those parties be shut down? I bet a lot of these people charge for those house parties. That's probably a city ordinance, and I, you know, I couldn't tell that you what the ordinance says. They should probably pull out of the mothballs, right? What's that? They should pull the city ordinance out of the mothballs. People here are very upset. Right, yeah, no, I, I can tell, and rightfully so. Yeah. Sure. There is actually a city ordinance regarding um, having to respond to noise problems. The first one I think is um, it's just a warning and then it's like $100 and then $200 and then $300. There is an ordinance on the books. Yeah. It just needs to be enforced. But it's, um, the city council did pass an ordinance regarding, I'm sorry, long time ago. Um, that people can be hit in the pocketbook. I think that's the only way that anybody's going to get it, yeah. is if you can do it that yeah. way. One more tool we can use, absolutely. Yeah, so maybe maybe you can reach out. I think Wynn Farwell knows knows the ordinance as well. Maybe you can... I'll look it up when I get all the city ordinances yeah. on my computer. Yeah, because I was looking up. I remember when you guys actually then made another point of bringing it up in, in the city council meeting mm -hmm. about the when they reinforced it about um, no time limit, and if you're impeding on our enjoyment of our peaceful time, then there should be some kind of uh, fine involved. Sure. Ma'am? My problem, oh, <laughs> my problem is with this area, right from the Gilmore School down Clinton. We have like the biggest drug dealer right there on Pine Ave. About a month ago, there was a shooting on Pine Ave, right out my bedroom window, at 1.30 in the afternoon, shooting out car windows, right there, right there on Emerald Street. Mm -hmm. And I have lived there my whole life, and the amount of cars that come out of Emerald Street should never, ever be, for the amount of houses that are there. There's a school right down here. Kids walk up there, and the cars are parked all over the place. There's no place for the kids to walk. There's not sidewalk. The cars are parked on both sides of Emerald plus Pine Ave. And there's constant drug dealing. It was um, about two weeks ago. You could come sit on my porch and watch what goes on in this house. You're welcome anytime. Sit there on a Friday night. You get all the car numbers, everything. It was a shooting or something on a Friday night. There were cars all over the place, going in and out of that house, in and out, everybody. The whole weekend, quiet after shooting. Nobody came around. And I know it was, I, I'm telling you, come sit on my porch and you'll see it all. And I think uh, Ms. O'Brien could back me up as far as, um, they don't even have a school crossing guard up there, but the school has taken it on itself, right? You have two of the gentlemen from the school that actually walked the kids up there. They took it upon themselves because of the danger of these kids walking. Mm -hmm. So in this small area, there's a whole lot going on, a whole lot. And we really need a lot of help down here. The kids sure. play baseball down here. All that's going on. Kids are walking on emerald and pine and all that's going on in the middle of the day, too. So, we need your help. All right. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. Um, I had quick, three quick things to say before we turn it on. The first one is, during the budget hearings last week, I had the opportunity to speak to um, Chief Crowley, and I asked him for more patrolmen. And I, I told him that I believe we need more boots on the ground. And certainly this, this, is, um, this is evidence of that, isn't it? And the second thing is, I'm tracking the C-click fix calls that come in from Ward 4. And I want you to know that in two months, Ward 4 put in 83 C-click fix calls. So what that says to me is that we're using it. Keep using it. 
Use it often and don't be afraid to do it and then to call Maine, okay? Um, the next, our next speaker is a Ward 4 resident and he's going to speak briefly on mortgage foreclosures. Brian Moriarty from NeighborWorks. Thanks, Counselor. Um, I'm a Ward 4 guy. I live up in uh, Copeland Street. Um, NeighborWorks has been here about 10 years. We came in, we were doing, for, uh, we were doing home buyer education, and then 2008 came, and the foreclosure crisis hit Brockton hard. So we were uh, granted through, the, through Congress, through the National Foreclosure Mitigation Program, uh, grant, uh, we were recipients of the, uh, the National Foreclosure Mitigation for the, uh, for the past 10 years. So we, uh, we held, we paid staff for the past uh, 10 years. We have five staff. So we do, uh, we're a HUD counseling agency. Our services for foreclosure uh, counseling is free. Um, we act as an advocate for you in applying for a modification. Uh, and we call and make sure that the, uh, the application is correct and we follow up with phone calls. So if you have any questions, I've, I've got information here, I'll put it on the desk. Uh, you know, along with for, um, foreclosure counseling, we do home buyer education. That's critically important because those that receive home buyer education are much less likely to be foreclosed on. Uh, we do reverse uh, mortgage counseling, we do down payment assistance, uh, veteran services, uh, we do um, uh, VITA, uh, volunteer income tax uh, 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 assistance program uh, every year in, Janu in January, February, March. Uh, it's free and uh, uh, we did over 500 uh, people this year. So I'm going to leave uh, uh, these uh, flyers out, and if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you. It was really important to me that Mr. Moriarty came to speak tonight. Brockton has among the highest rates of mortgage foreclosures in 2018. 10 years after um, the, the big recession and the, the crash in 2008. And that's very troubling and upsetting. And I should tell you that City Councilor Ann Beauregard, who's just walked in, is, is right at the forefront of the City Council working on this to get our residents help and assistance um, with their mortgage foreclosure issues. And I should tell you at this time, not only has Councilor Beauregard come in, but so has State Senator Michael Brady, and I'm grateful for their support here tonight. So our next speaker is a real hot ticket, and she is the principal of the school we're sitting in tonight, the Gilmore Elementary School, and she works so hard for the children that attend this school. Please clap for Mary Beth O'Brien. did not arrive. Do you see? Right? Hair and makeup didn't arrive today, so please excuse my appearance. I was at a baseball game with my students all day. Um, so I'm the principal of the Gilmore Elementary School, formerly the Huntington Elementary School, which I'm sure many of you have walked through, if not attended, correct? So last year, uh, we brought our entire school body here to the Gilmore from the Huntington. So we opened our doors this September, and I'm sure anyone who lives in the area, you weren't so happy about the traffic, so I'm sorry. Hopefully it's gotten a little bit better. But it's definitely better than it was on Warren Avenue, right? 
Okay, so a couple of things about our school because we are unique in comparison to the other 11 elementary schools is we're what you call an expanded learning time school. So back about seven years ago when June Saba McGuire was the principal of the Huntington, we worked together as a faculty and with our families and uh, we worked with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education in order to expand our school day. Um, in order to provide our students with more opportunity than they are, were getting from their suburban counterparts. With that said, um, where we are today, our students uh, are the, actually the Raymond joined us last year with this, but our students wear school uniforms, so you'll always know if it's them causing trouble, so never hesitate to give me a call if you see it say Gilmore or Huntington. Some of them are still wearing their uniforms um, that say Huntington. So they wear navy blue collared shirts and khaki pants, and we teach them that you need to dress for success. In addition to that, they attend school 90 minutes a day longer than every other elementary school. And what we build into that time is not only core academics to provide them with some increased opportunity to gain against their um, the global com competition that's out there, right? Uh, because it's getting more and more difficult to compete in the STEM and the global economy. But in addition to that, we offer a great deal of enrichment opportunities built into our school day. Many of you almost walked into the, our community room right when you enter the school, but what you saw in there was Bridgewater State University holding a college course. But also during the school day, Bridgewater State University comes in and they serve as mentors to a lot of our students here. And that happens with three different components throughout the day. Our favorite partnership, don't tell Bridgewater that I just said that, they're my favorite too, but our newest partner, and it's a thriving partnership, is with the YMCA. I have one of our YMCA peacemakers right back there. Yeah. Who I have to say did a far better job hosting an assembly than I ever could when we had a peace rally just this year, and it was so much fun. Um, but in addition to that, the YMCA comes in and provides one hour of enrichment to our students during the day. They painted that gorgeous parking lot that you see out there to make this look like a loving, warm, absolutely exciting environment for our students. All of the posters that you see if you decide to walk around the school before you leave and they say things like kindness counts and all of these great slogans. My YMCA family came in at the beginning of the year and did all of that for our students. They host a lot of family nights and they also empower our families by having a parent cafe here. Um, but we just offer a great deal beyond the regular school day for our students. And really my, my slogan, and often uh, the assistant principal rolls his eyes when I say this because he thinks I'm like a slogan queen, but we're the Huntington Hawks, so now we're the Gilmore Hawks. And what I believe in is it takes a flock to raise a hawk. Don't you love that? Isn't, isn't that so gimmicky and elementary, if you will? Um, but the best part about that is that one of the things that we've really tried to foster over the last two years, and it's really part of our growing partnership now as an ELT school, is to really involve our kids in the community so that they can see that this is their home. And really, education and our students are our future. So we can sit and we can talk about what's happening beyond the school walls and what's happening in the community, but unless we invest in our kids and educate them about what matters to build a thriving community, know that when they're walking from here to the Campello T to go on their field trip that they need to pick trash up along their way. When they go and they build, um, one of the things we did this year that one of my favorite events um, I'm sure you all know Lynn from the Keith Park Neighborhood Association, Lynn Smith. Does everybody know her? If you don't, you should. I love the woman. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be able to put on a lot of my community events. But um, in the fall, in November, we have what we call the Holiday History Lantern Walk. We started at the Huntington, and now we're doing it again at the Gilmore. And we take our kids and we walk through the Campello neighborhood and learn about the history and then they decorate the flower boxes on Main Street. And really the idea is to really take part in your community and try and find the beauty in it and engage yourself in it because that's the best way to keep it thriving, right? Right? So that's really what we do here. If you ever have any ideas of something going on in your neighborhood or in your community and you want the kids to be involved, we're happy to do that. 
Um, and when we open our doors in September, this um, wall over here that kind of appears to be the front of the school, but it's actually the side of the school, that's going to have a big, beautiful mural, uh, similar to the murals that you see downtown of W.B. Mason, on the side of W.B. Mason with Fenway Park, and then some of the other ones of Rocky Marciano and things like that. We're actually going to have um, something that's a tribute to schools and education over the years, because the best part about Campello is the rich history and the immigration that's occurred right here in this little nook and cranny of Brockton. Um, but the one thing that's always been common is the fact that we've educated everyone, and that's really important to us. So you're going to see those themes um, in that mural, and it's going to be beautiful. So welcome to the Gilmore. Um, if anyone's bored next Friday, we had our Gilmore Fun Run, and I'm sure you hear about this or if you pay any attention to Facebook. Um, schools are engaging in this fundraiser, and it's called a fun run, where kids get pledges and they raise money for the school, and then um, they challenge their principal that if they raise the money, their principal has to do something foolish to embarrass them. And although it doesn't look it, I actually do have great hair, not tonight, so I told them I would not do anything crazy to my hair. So they went back and forth and they found a million different things that they wanted to do and some of it has been in the paper about principals kissing pigs or principals um, spending a day on the roof. I'm not going to do any of that. So um, the assistant principal, of course, came up with the idea and I swear it's to torture me. Um, but next Friday at 2 o'clock, the kids get their reward and they get to throw jello at me. Yes. And they get to toss a pie in my face. Mm hmm Yeah. So I will be wearing a shower cap and perhaps a wetsuit, but that will happen. But it is a good time, so, um, and it's a great way to build community. So if you're around, it's our fun day, and if you want to come on down and join us, you're welcome to do that. Okay? So thanks for coming. You're welcome to the Gilmore anytime. Brett Gormley is our Ward 4 school committee person. He was not able to be here tonight. He had three other places to be. I think they must be cloning him. He's written me a short letter that I'd like to read to you. Here's what's going on. Currently, we are awaiting the state budget to be finalized. The House budget boosted our funding by $1.3 million, and the Senate budget gave us another $2 million for a total of $3.3 million. That will allow the school district to recall a good number of teachers. Our budget gap was created by our broken funding formula, which left us with a $10 million shortfall. Much of that is due to New Hearts Charter School's enrollment. Call your Brockton representatives and encourage them to support Bill S-2525, which would implement changes to the state education funding formula. On a brighter note, Brockton High School graduated 952 students on June 2nd. It was a great day for all involved. The facilities department and BHS staff do an amazing job coordinating them, this massive undertaking. If you need to contact Brett, his email is brettgormleyward4 at gmail.com and his phone number is 508-813-9919. And right now, I would like to welcome Councilor at Large Wynn Farwell, and he's going to speak about the proposed ordinance for the retail sale of cannabis. This is really funny because I was an only child brought up in a very strict Yankee family and I became a summer cop down the Cape at age 19. Never tried marijuana, never put a joint in my mouth, have no idea why people have a love affair with it, which I found out since the, the substance has been legalized and we're, we're working on marijuana regulation. So I can't tell you anything about what it does or it doesn't do, but I can tell you what we're trying to do with respect to the regulations in Brockton. Uh, 
As you know, it was legalized in the state election of 2016. After that, there was a Cannabis Control Commission that was formed. They came out with regulations. On March 19th, the City Council Finance Committee held a meeting and we talked about the law and how it would be implemented. And we were told by the city solicitor we would probably receive some information in about three weeks. The next day, the mayor filed through one of our fellow colleagues regulations, zoning ordinances, and other orders relating to the marijuana issue. So needless to say, we were kind of caught, as you would say, flat-footed about that. The state regulations, by the way, are over 100 pages. That has to be read. The zoning regulations, which we're currently considering in Councilor at Large, Bob Sullivan is the chair of ordinance. I'm also a member of ordinance. Those are critically important because this is a brand new industry. Does it have the potential for bringing in revenue to the city? It does. But does it have the potential for changing the flavor of Brockton forever? I think it does. Now, the mayor has advocated having, I think, three, if not four, locations downtown. He does see this as a revenue-generating industry. I respect his point of view, but we have taken our time, much to the criticism of some people, to carefully go over the regulations that the state has proposed and to create our own and to look at zoning. Now, why is zoning important? It would seem to me, and I'm going to ask you for an informal poll in a minute, it would seem to me we wouldn't want to zone an area near a school and allow sale of recreational marijuana products, whether it's the substance itself or gummy bears or marijuana brownies or all of the other things that go along with it. It would seem to me we wouldn't want to do it near the libraries. It would seem to me we wouldn't want to do it near the YMCA. It would seem to me we wouldn't want to do it near health clinics or other health facilities. So for all of those reasons, we have to look at the entire zoning map in Brockton and try to come up with some type of coherent and also safe procedure for where these establishments might be located. Now, you have to allow 20% of the number of alcoholic beverage licenses for recreational marijuana sales. So if there's 40 licenses in Brockton for alcohol, I think we have to allow approximately seven to eight marijuana licensed establishments. That's what we're working on. There will be a meeting in July of the Ordinance Committee, and we will have all of our members there. We'll be looking over the zoning map. We'll be looking at business regulations. Whatever happens, we want to do it right. I mean, this is our city. It's going to attract a different type of clientele. I mean, people coming in to buy marijuana are not going to be the same people that, you know, go up to the mall to uh, the steakhouse. And it sounds humorous, but it's all the unknown. And, and we can't just generalize and say, well, this is how it worked in Colorado. This is how it worked in the state of Washington. You really have to drill down to what will the impact be on Brockton and how can we make this as successful as we can. So that's where we are. We have not taken any action yet. We are going slow. We are reading. We are doing research. Some of us are looking at what other states have done, what business regulations have been enacted, what restrictions have been put in place to protect children, because that's, to me, that's the key. We know that we do have occasions when children, and when I say children, I mean people under the age of 21, get alcoholic beverages. We have to make sure that we are prepared in this city to protect kids under the age of 21 from getting into marijuana products. I mean, that's just a given. Forget the revenue, forget everything else. I want to make sure from a public safety standpoint that we protect our kids and our grandkids and make sure that they are not exposed to this particular industry before they're of sufficient age to make determinations for themselves. So that's, again, where we are. I do have just a couple of quick questions. I happen to be one of the people that favored putting out a ballot question, as other towns have done, to allow people to vote on this. Do you want recreational marijuana sales? That received a pretty lukewarm reception from some of my colleagues and other people, but just unscientific poll. If it were on a special ballot during the state election in November, 
Would you favor having that option? How many people would favor having that option to be able to vote on? And how many feel that we voted on it once in 2016 and let's get on with it? And, and I respect that point of view, too. I mean, don't be afraid to, if you feel that way, I'd, I'd like to know it. Okay. How many people favor downtown locations for recreational marijuana sales as opposed to other sections, perhaps on the perimeter of the, of the city? How many people would favor the downtown? Okay, one, two, three. And how many people would favor the, I don't want to say the outskirts of the city, but the four corners of the city in terms of location, such as the mall or um, up on North uh, Montello Street or somewhere? Well, the third choice is you vote and you don't have it at all, but that's, uh, you know. Okay. Well, that's it. I want to save sufficient time for everyone to ask questions that they still may have. I really thank you for your input, and I hope that some of you, if you can, will attend whatever meeting we have in July of the Ordinance Committee so you can actually hear the, the dialogue, the debate going back and forth between the five of us. There are five counselors on that committee, and we're really entering an era where it's if you can't attend in person, please watch it on local cable because you really need to be involved in what's going on in the city. It, it's that critical. It's, it's, we've just entered an era where I think people have to be well informed and have to be involved, and you have to hold us accountable. You know, if we do something wrong, we need to know it. If you want us to do something, we need to know it. So I thank you very much, and I thank Susan for giving me the opportunity to come in here for a few minutes. Ian, then we, we can do we can do questions in a minute, right? You have something to read? Yes. Okay. Ian is my bodyguard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm reading this on behalf of uh, a gentleman at, who has mobilized a group, and you'll be hearing a lot more about this this summer. And this is a, a Reverend uh, Richard Reed. He's the pastor of the um, North Baptist Church, and uh, he writes to uh, Council Susan Castro earlier this week, I wish I could be with you this evening, but due to a weekly meeting I cannot attend, but I want to reach out to you with a brief message. As a pastor of one of Brockton's churches, I see a lot of hardships that individuals and families go through each and every day. I wish we had the resources to resolve every issue, but we do not. There is one thing that we can all do, and that is to work together to help stop future tragedies and to not pile on top of the existing problems in our city. There are some people who think that opening multiple recreational marijuana businesses in Brockton will help resolve some of the financial woes not afflicting our city. The truth is, as the evidence is examined in places where this has already been in place, it is the exact opposite of what some of our community leaders are saying. Homelessness, distracted driving, Vehicle accidents, increased burdens on the emergency medical services, emergency rooms, and city budgets all have risen dramatically since the opening of recreational marijuana businesses. For every dollar of marijuana tax revenue, there are $10 spent in costs associated to these businesses. This is just bad business. A new law pending at the state capitol will put the burden on the taxpayer if the marijuana businesses do not do as well as they anticipate. Increased service fees and taxes are at risk we cannot absorb. Please let your counselor and all the councils at large know we demand a ballot question this November to give you a voice for the future of Brockton. Let's come up with some positive ways to enhance Brockton. Sincerely, Pastor Richard Reed, North Baptist Church. So I just will preface this by saying there will be meetings throughout the summer that we encourage people to attend that are interested in speaking out on this issue, pro, con, or in between, 
and being a part of all this, and we encourage you to always attend all meetings in this city, whether the award meetings, ordinance meeting, finance committee meeting, accounts committee, there are all sorts of meetings going on. Remember, you own Brockton. You can't put it on eBay if you don't want it anymore. You can't have a yard sale to get rid of it. So you can make it a better place by being a part of it. So thank you. Appreciate your time here. Okay. Okay, any, any last minute questions? Dennis. Some of you read my article in, in the newspaper two weeks ago about no pot shops in Brockton. As a school teacher, physical education, health teacher for years, I think it's absurd, I think it's ludicrous with the amount of violence we already have. I don't want to get into the psychological and physiological effects of marijuana, but it's just not good for the human body, period. That vote in November, and Captain, you can comment on this too, was about decriminalizing marijuana in Massachusetts. Now, you go outside Massachusetts, it's still federal law, it's still illegal. All right, if you get caught with, I think it's $50 of marijuana or more, that's a criminal act outside of the state. I don't know what it is, and I think there's still a law about dealing marijuana. But the mayor wants this. He's looking for money. We have two city councilors. Pot Shop Tom, I'm going to call him. You were generous in not naming his name, but I'm going to name it. He put an ordinance in for marijuana sales in downtown without even conferring and talking to members of his city council about it. The mayor is desperate for money, but at the expense of children. Now, we have to have it on a ballot. The other night I asked for, for the city council for two, an override on Proposition 2 and a half of public safety, fire and police. We're about 20 police officers shot, Captain, in Brockton. Okay, and we also have three fire engines that don't work and three, four, three more fire engines that are about ready to go to bunk. It is ludicrous to even think about having pot shops around children, around the schools. It's ludicrous. We also had one counselor, and there's going to be four, definitely, that will vote against not having it on a referendum come November. We the people, and I'm leading a charge on this, we the people must go after our city councils, but there's four of them that won't, okay, to put it on a referendum. I don't know how any city councilor can deny democracy, deny people the right to vote. I really don't, okay? But we have some that are going to try and deny, the, deny us the right to vote on this issue, whether we want them or don't want them in Brockton. And I've met with Reverend Reed, Council Farewell, on this a lot. We can't allow this to happen. I want you to understand something, too, that every city around us and town around us voted it down. Rockland is the only one in the whole South Shore area that wanted it. So where do you think these people are going to come? Do we really want children walking by smelling the stuff in the air? Okay. All right. So the other day, Jack Lally, Council Lally, went after the Reverend Reed horribly. He even was upset that churches don't pay taxes. Okay. Now, we have the right to vote, and we need it on a referendum. Let the people decide. I almost think it's illegal, a civil right violation, to say to people, you don't have a right to vote. I really do, and I'm checking on that right now. It needs to be on a referendum. You know, people, I can honestly look at you and say, I never smoked a joint in my life, I never bought it, I never sold it, I never used it, because I know it's bad for you. I was an athlete all my life, too. But that's one reason. But it's just not good for you. And we've got to keep it away from kids. There will be more crime. There will be more violence. What's also bothering me right now is the police department has been silent on this. The school department has been silent on it. We've got to get somehow, some way, people on school departments, people in law enforcement have got to speak up against this. 
We need you. We need you desperately. Money should not be at the expense of children. Please, please push for this on the referendum. We need it, and we need to vote no sales of marijuana in Brockton. Thank you. How do we do that? What do we do um, in regards to that? What do we do as community members? We, 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 we would put an order forward that would instruct the city to place on the ballot a question, shall so recreation. So that's the counselors that have to do yeah, that. Yeah, it falls on what us. What do we do as community members? Tell our I, counselors I would that's lobby what we want. the other counselors at large, Bob Sullivan, yeah. John Bradley Durenancourt, okay. Moises Rodriguez. You all have email. Uh, I know where that is. Yeah, so. we're all on okay. a web page. And, yeah. uh, you know, I see, I agree with what Dennis said. I think it's democracy. Without getting into whether you're a favor of marijuana or you want, give people a shot. Let them vote like the other communities did. So, anything else? Going once? Oh, way in the back. Okay. I, I lost my voice, so I'm sorry. So you're talking about like the children and not being around these pot shops. What about all of the paraphernalia shops that are out? You're talking about if, there, if there's a pot shop, that you're gonna smell the marijuana as the kids walk by it. What about the smoke shop that they just opened up on the corner of Warren Ave and, excuse me, Forest Ave that glorifies all of the bongs and everything else that's there? Do you think that they don't walk by these places and smell the pot too? Like what's the city going to do for that? Every time you turn around, there's some new shop that's opening up that sells the papers, that sells, you know, the bongs, that sells everything else that you need for this pot. I, I'm not like for the, the pot shop, like, you know, for them to sell the marijuana in Brockton, but what's Brockton gonna do about all of these other places? You can go like a half a mile down the road and just keep seeing these. Brockton High School kids walk right by them all the time. So it's not as if the city's even trying to do anything as far as keeping all of this away from the children. They just seem to keep saying, okay, well, there's an empty building, we're gonna make it a smoke shop. Oh, here's an empty building, we're gonna make it this. That they're, they're glorifying it without even selling it in the city is what it looks like. If you go by that one that's on the corner of Warren Ave and Forest Ave, they have these huge um, pictures. It has this ginormous sign. It like pretty much says, come here, come here, come here. So to me, I think that the city is glorifying it before even having the pot shops in here to begin with. We're still bringing people from other cities to come in here to purchase all of that stuff there because you can go to the smaller towns all around, they don't have like 7,000 of these smoke shops all over the place glorifying all of the stuff to be able to have for the marijuana. It is legal in Massachusetts. Whether they buy it here or not, they can still get it. But we're telling them that, you know, we're kind of glorifying it and making it look pretty. Do they have any like intentions on if we do get, they, they do do the smoke, the, um, not the smoke shops, but the marijuana facilities. Are they going to, like, you know, limit how many of these smoke shops they're going to allow to continue to keep opening? I, I, I think I would answer it this way. For some people, not all, for some people, marijuana is a gateway to another drug. Not for everyone. I, and I can't tell you the percentage. I did have a member of the clergy who works with Teen Challenge tell me that if you want, I'll have all of my people come in and explain to you that if you have an addicted, addictive personality, if you're prone to that, and you start in marijuana, there is a danger that you will go on to something else. Now, with respect to the smoke shops, fortunately in my lifetime we have cut back on advertising for tobacco. Uh, not enough, but we have. And I think we've kind of turned the corner because I don't think smoking is as popular now as it was when I was growing up. I think for some of us what we're worried about is that if all of the other communities around us have said, no, we don't want any sales of these marijuana products, what does that mean for traffic and people coming into the city, public safety-wise, perhaps driving under the influence of marijuana, which is very hard to prove when you're a law enforcement officer. There's no breathalyzer for grass. 
you, you just got to hope that you can make the observations and then put a case together. So it's difficult to enforce. If they're open during the day, and I heard the, that they wanted them open from 9 in the morning until 6 or 7 at night, and is it 8 o'clock? 8 o'clock at night. So if that's true, will we have this influx of people coming into the city if they're located downtown traveling by all our schools where we have a significant school population that still walks to school? So again, I think you've raised the point, let people vote. Because well, if that's not it. Like, so the smoke shops you're saying are smoke shops for tobacco. I mean, pretty much we all know that the smoke shops are no longer for tobacco. The smoke shops are for all marijuana paraphernalia. Very rarely do you have anybody who rolls their own cigarettes nowadays. So anything that they're buying at these smoke shops has absolutely nothing to do with tobacco. It all has to do with marijuana. It's had to do with marijuana since way before marijuana was even legal. But we still allow it. We allow, like, we allow the corner stores to sell drug paraphernalia, whether they want to say it's tobacco paraphernalia or not, we know what it is. That shop that's on Forest Avenue, they have, they have bongs that are the size of like, they are this tall all across the whole front of their windows. That, that's not for anybody who smokes tobacco. I don't know too many people that are gonna buy a bong this big to have a cigarette. Like that's, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that we're putting these shops all over the place. So you're talking about kids not being exposed to the marijuana that they're going to be selling. Technically, I feel that they're more exposed to the paraphernalia that makes it look like it's a fun thing to do than technically they would if it was a marijuana shop that you have to be 21 years of age or older to get into. Is, is what I'm saying. My thing is, is every time you turn around, I, we can walk down the street on Main Street and I can find probably 15 places on Main Street that are going to sell you bongs and rolling papers and cigars that we all know turn into blunts. I mean, everybody knows this thing. Whether you smoke weed or you don't smoke weed, that's what everybody knows. But the city doesn't seem to stop any of that. They just keep giving permits to these people to just open up all of these shops again. So we're glorifying the marijuana before we're even selling it in the city. So I want to know if there's ever going to be an, like some type of an ordinance where we're going to say enough is enough. We don't need any more of these bongs to be sold all over the place. You can buy them when you go get gas. You know, I mean, you can go to some gas stations and you can buy yourself a Jamaican patty, a bong, and get gas. They, they, there's no, there's like, there's nothing that you really like. You can sell anything you want to out of there. So my thing is, is are we ever gonna stop like allowing the permits to go out for these places to have all of this stuff all the time? Because to me, that's more glorifying it than selling it legally in, in, in the city. Well, you do need a license to sell tobacco products. Right, but this uh, isn't tobacco that they're no, selling. No, I, I understand that. I do not know constitutionally if you could prevent people from selling bonds because I can just see someone waltzing into federal court and saying, that's an artistic piece. I have that on my mantle. But I can't the to... city put a limit as to how many permits they're going to be giving to people in the city? The, the honest answer is, I don't know if we can do that. That would be kind of like a licensing and a constitutional question as to whether you could limit the, the paraphernalia that perhaps goes with a substance that's controlled. So, I, and I'm not trying to be evasive, but to be honest with you, I never thought about it. No, I, I mean, that's fine. Like I said, you were just saying earlier about how we don't want to expose our children to the marijuana facilities, but we expose them every day when they walk into like a corner store to get milk possibly for their parents, and they see all of this drug paraphernalia that's legally allowed to be sold. Well, I, here's what, now I can only speak for myself, I can't speak for my colleagues, but if we're going to spend the next 10 or 15 years on a downtown urban renewal project, and if we are potentially going to spend six to seven million dollars to change traffic to two-way downtown, all of which I haven't digested yet because I'm still concerned about streets being repaved and reconstructed in neighborhoods, I don't think we're going to accomplish much if we then have an industry downtown where people are walking with their children. Presuming we have restaurants that pop up or something else, I don't think they're going to want to walk their kids through a cloud of marijuana smoke. That's what I think bothers us. Now, tobacco smoke, yeah, I'd probably 
you know, keep my grandkids away from inhaling secondhand tobacco smoke, but do we really want to have a situation where we spend a lot of time and energy and money trying to make the downtown area attractive, but at the same time we attract an industry where people are going to be walking around with their marijuana cigarettes and you've got to take your kids or your grandkids through a cloud of smoke? I don't, I don't think so, but that's just my opinion. My opinion doesn't count. I'm one person, one vote. The reason I'd like to see it on the ballot is because all of you count, whichever way it goes. I mean, I can live with, if it's 80-20, we want it, that's fine. If it's 60-40, we don't want it, that's fine. But for all of the reasons that you and I have just discussed, give people a chance to vote. Let them read, learn, and then exercise their constitutional right to decide. Because I'm telling you, this, in my lifetime, this may be one of the most profound decisions that this city makes. It's going to forever change Brockton. I, I, and I hope I haven't appeared evasive to any of you. I, I can only tell you what I know and what I feel. And then, as I say, you really are the people who count. Collectively, we all count, but you count what you think. Yes, ma'am. Put that on the ballot. Is that binding? That the marijuana will not be allowed to come to Brockton, like the other cities, they all voted against it. If we say no, we don't want it. If we say no, we don't want it, is that going to happen, or are they going to say no? It's a non-binding thing. No, my understanding is, if the ballot question is properly worded and it passes, it is binding. It's called an opt-out. There's an opt-out provision in the marijuana law that has been passed by the voters in 2016. So, yes, it would be a definitive answer as to which way the community went. Okay, thanks. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Farwell. And I just wanted to say that looking into a possible ordinance dealing with paraphernalia is a good idea, and I will do it. Okay? Okay. So it's your turn. What other questions and comments do you have? Mr. Hogan. Thank you, Susan. I'm not on the agenda, but Susan allowed me to have 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, Believe it or not, I used to be an athlete and a swimmer. That's why I wore the shirt, so you know it. Um, I own the. My name is Bill Hogan. I own the Downtown Brock Museum. We're in the. Um, we actually have a number of grassroots plans and efforts that we've been doing. I'm just going to leave it at that. One of them is returning youth swim meets to Brockton, and we're going to do that this year. It's on August 4th. And the principal from the Gilmore School mentioned helping out on um, events that are coming up. I'd like to talk to you before you leave. Maybe you can um, start talking about the swim meet a little bit. Anyway, uh, before I go too much further, there happens to be a couple of swimmers in the, um, in the, uh, in the audience. Dennis, who spoke just a minute ago, is in the uh, Athletic Hall of Fame. He, he was a Brockton High swimmer. Um, he wouldn't have brought it up if I didn't. I think Kathy Rose is here. She was on the Brockton High team. She's not, she's not here anymore. Anyway, this is the old Brockton High, uh, Brockton Enterprise, the Brockton Enterprise Swim Meet. We used to get 300 to 350 to 400 kids entered in these swim meets. The, the top picture shows the Montello pool. The bottom picture shows the Campello pool. I'm in all the photos. I don't remember if I won, but I'm in there. My mother took these photos. Anyway, we're looking towards August 4th to bring these meets back to the Lawrence R. Cosgrove Memorial Pool, which is on Crescent Street. Uh, most people are familiar with the, the Pluff Academy, and that's where the pool is. I have um, registration forms here. Uh, this is the first night we're putting them out in the public, and basically they're open to everybody any age group. It's eight and under, and it goes all the way up to 18-year-old as far as the youth goes, and we even have a master's division for any adults that would like to swim. 
So um, we don't even care if you can swim. We, what we do is you can get in the meet and we have what they call helpers and they can say maybe pull some of the younger kids along the pool. So it's basically open to anybody. We have a challenger division actually or a special Olympics. So nobody's excluded from this, from the swim meet. And um, we've, we've had a lot of discussion tonight about a lot of negative things in Brockton. And unfortunately, they, they, take the, um, they take the headlines in the paper, they take more, um, more of the, uh, the press, it's more of the discussion on social um, issues. These events here, like this, uh, could be a very positive and a, a quite a, um, a very positive event for Brockton. And a, it's a, I don't know how to really explain it, but it's something that Brockton should get behind, whether you're a swimmer or not. It really doesn't. It doesn't matter if we can find the next Mark Spitz. Um, if anybody's old, old enough like me, he was the. He was the big swimmer in the 70s and won seven gold medals. And I would, I would mention the kid that just won like 20 gold medals, but I'll be darned if I can remember his name. But my point is, we don't know who's in Brockton. We could have a Mark Spitz, we could have a great swimmer. That would be fine if we found him, but it doesn't really matter. This is a positive event that anybody can take part of. And I'd like to have, ask you to look into this, um, spread the word. Um, do what you can, enter. Um, I don't know if I'm forgetting anything. Um, yeah, and uh, this is the beginning of the promotional part of this um, the swim meet. Also, while I have at least half the um, city council here, I would like to ask them if they would um, consider taking part in the swim meet. They don't hear me. They're gonna. They think they're gonna. That I'm gonna ignore them. But we we're asking the city council <laughs> to help us with the meet as far as like timing and giving out awards and, um, and be a part of the, uh, the event. So thank you, I could go on all night talking about it. I do have registration forms here, or you could stop at the museum and get one. Um, the museum's at 138 Main Street downtown. Thank you. Thank you, Bill Hogan, man with good and thoughtful ideas to help Brockton. Okay, well at this time, who would like to speak? Who's got a question or concern for me? Uh, the last thing I heard about the power plant is that the uh, commissioner of the DEP is going to approve the uh, air quality permit. So they will finally have a permit. Yeah. Um, as for Aquaria, Aquaria came to the City Council a few months ago seeking an amendment to our contract with them after 10 years. They'd like to reduce the number of millions gallons per day that they, they are required to provide to Broughton because they're not able to provide it without doing some infrastructure improvements that are very costly. Um, there were, for myself, there were a lot of questions I had about the, the proposed amendment that no one would answer. And in the end, the uh, council voted to table the matter. So it's not dead, but it is tabled at this time. Someone else a question? OK. OK. Someone else? Well, thank you. It's 810. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. If you need me, I'm at 508-941-6772, Ward 4 Counselor Susan DeCastro. Thank you for coming. Good night.